Adrian Stein, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. It's great to have you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. So we have been crossing paths for years now and never had the opportunity to really sit down and talk. So this is a huge honor for me. Likewise, me too. I know we've we've crossed paths so many times at the Portrait Society and um, it's been almost a decade. I've been seeing you on stage and admiring your demos and and um, now it's great to finally get a chance to- Has it to... really been a decade that we've yeah, been crossing paths? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I can't remember your first year at the Portrait Society. I'm trying to remember how many years have you been doing uh, I think I started there, in, well, I think it's been uh, nine years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. My first Portrait Society, I was, I was 22. And I'm 36 now. So wow. <laughs> so I haven't gone to every single one of them. I, I skipped, you know, a number of years where I had other things going on. But then I just been on faculty for about five years now. But, um, you know, it's funny, because I was thinking about your work and where I first encountered your work was even long before the Portrait Society, because I went to Laguna College of Art and Design in Laguna Beach, California. And there used to be uh, Went Gallery used to be in um, Laguna Beach, right on Pacific Coast Highway. And I remember as an 18-year-old freshman at Laguna College of Art and Design, seeing your work there for the first time and admiring it. And well, thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. So it's really cool how things have come full circle after all these years. Yeah, it's crazy. That seems like another life, um, yeah. that whole Went Gallery scene. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, and back then, my gosh, it was... I mean, you're young now and uh, you're even younger back then. So it was probably before you even had your children or anything like that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you were just a rock star back then. Oh, well, that's nice of you to say. Well, so the first thing I want to know about you is, well, you've already told me you went to Laguna College of Art and Design, but yeah, let's go back a little bit further. Tell me about your life and how you decided to go into the arts and just your background in general. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate thing about it is that it's not a very exciting story because it was so straightforward. So my um, beginning was was very early in my life in the arts. And so I started drawing and painting pretty seriously before I was a, a teenager. I mean, I was, uh, you know, probably like nine or 10 when I started using soft pastels and I was 11 when I started uh, oil painting and studying with a mentor. So I had wow. a classical style of atelier training in a in a studio with a mentor, and it was kind of like private instruction. Um, he really did, never took on more than four students at a time, so uh, he really taught me the the kind of French Academy method. He made his own Merger medium. Um, I had to draw for an entire year before I could even touch oil paint. So um, you know, he was very. Um, you know, he wasn't dogmatic about his color theory or about, you know, how he approached painting, but he was just very rigorous and methodical and taught me how to draw and really gave me the fundamentals that I used for the rest of my life up to the present. And so I, I really credit him. Um, his name is Richard House. He was a very humble man and he made his living teaching art and doing still life paintings that would be reproduced for wallpaper, actually. Really? So, um, yeah, he was, uh, but he was an incredibly gifted teacher, and I was so grateful to have had the time with him that I that I had. And I studied with him from the time I was 11 years old till the time I was 18, and moved to California to go to Laguna, as I mentioned before. So I had seven years with him, and um, in that time, he taught me so much and I had to do everything that really an atelier trained artist would have to do. So I, you know, did master copies on a regular basis and of course learned to draw and paint from life. Um, did short pose and long term, long pose figure drawings and also um, painting still life from life for a long time before I even started the figure. So uh, my training was very classical and I was just fortunate to have that. And so then when I got to Laguna, it was a really great foundation because Laguna, of course, really is like an atelier in that life drawing and uh, drawing and painting from life is such a huge part of the curriculum there. But 
uh, the narrative aspect is very important too. And of course, because of its proximity to LA and um, the gaming and movie industry, I feel like there's also a strong emphasis on narrative and because the other majors, I was a fine art major there, but um, the other majors are um, you know, illustration and graphic design and now there's a gaming and entertainment major. So I was interacting with a lot of people who were thinking about um, storytelling and multi-figures and uh, those kinds of things. So it was a really, really awesome place to go to school. I mean, I, I couldn't recommend it enough. It was the best, the best education. And then, you know, art history classes and classes in aesthetics. And, um, you know, it was just a really well-rounded art education that sort of added a little bit more to the academic, capital A ac academic foundation that I had before I went to school. Yeah. And then I, I sort of took the circuitous route because I, I then I, I studied with a number of other people in between. And I, I briefly moved to New York City to study at the Art Students League with Frank Mason, who has since passed away. Um, but he was in his late 80s and he was still teaching. And I really wanted to learn from him. And, um, you know, it was like that very classical Art Students League experience where, um, you know, on the third floor with the the skylight, you know, one north light source, kind of a dark studio. It's Rembrandt lighting and uh, all natural light and a long pose. And so, you know, um, Frank Mason was very much inspired by the Dutch masters. And so he had this very dramatic, high contrast, you know, Dutch way of painting. And, um, and I love that. Um, but, you know, I, I ended up then you know, I was doing a lot of portrait commissions and I was building up my work, building up my portfolio. Um, you know, I worked with a couple galleries and then um, in my mid twenties, I moved to Boston to go to Boston University and that's where I got my master's of fine art. So um, that was a completely, like complete 180 from what I had been doing because the program was run by an abstract expressionist painter and all of his influences were um, Frank Auerbach, Philip Gustin, um, you know, Jacuning, the New York School, all those really, really muscly, muscly abstract painters from the 50s. So, mm. um, and did yeah, you know that just, going into it? I did. Um, and I, I willingly signed myself up for it. Um, you know, something kind of uh, masochistic about that, I guess, knowing that I'd be so challenged and uh it, it was it was exactly that i mean it was such a paradigm shift because uh i kind of got made fun of for my heroes <laughs> like it was just very funny that you know i i went into that program and people couldn't believe that i liked john everett millet and uh Bouguereau and they they couldn't believe that i was looking at um dean cornwell and um that's so bizarre <laughs> <laughs> and like the illustrators, you know, it was, it was like, oh my gosh, like you have a poster of Maxfield Parish on your studio wall. What kind of cornball are you? You know what I mean? Everybody just thought I was very, um, you know, that I, I love these antiquated artists and um, illustrators. And so it was, it was an interesting kind of culture shock for me. And uh, I, to this day, I mean, it was, I'd say the hardest years of my life. I'm yeah, artistically at least, it was extremely confusing and discouraging at many times, but I'd still have to say I have no regrets because it was, you know, it was a big challenge to get me to think beyond my my paradigm and the artists that I was looking at. And, um, and I really took a lot of it with me uh, moving forward. So, so I was grateful for that experience. And then um, I moved back to Pennsylvania because by then I had lived in a number of exciting big cities, but I was ready for a studio space that was affordable for me and a pace of life that felt sustainable and calm. And uh, it's also, I'm, I'm very close with my family. Uh, my parents live very close to where we currently live and, um, and my siblings lived close by. So having that support of my family close by was really important to me. So I actually moved back to Pennsylvania after I got my MFA from Boston. And where in Pennsylvania and do you live? I live in York, Pennsylvania. So um, my husband, Kwang Ho, and I, who I know you're about to interview mm -hmm. uh, soon, 
Uh, we live in York, Pennsylvania, which is like south, uh, like southern Pennsylvania, right close to the Maryland border. So, um, oh, so it's, it's southeastern Pennsylvania. Southeastern, yeah, okay. right, eastern Pennsylvania. So it's very, um, you know, around us. It's there's a lot of unspoiled rural land around us, and it's really beautiful. Wow. Um, we live really close to Lancaster County, which is a big center of the Amish in the US and it's uh, very it's very conducive to uh, quietude and focus and just a just a wonderful pace of life that we really enjoy but um, my family lives 5 miles down the road from us and it's extremely helpful because especially now that we have a 15 month old son um, it's been really wonderful to have that family support close by too so yeah um, but you know, I, I was living in Pennsylvania when I met Huang, and he's from Denver, Colorado. So we, when we started dating, we started going back and forth. So he'd come out here and spend a couple months, and I'd go out there and spend a couple months. And um, we were incredibly fortunate to be able to do that because both of us were painting full time, you know, working with galleries, and things were kind of set there. So we were just uh, wherever we could paint, you know. So I'd kind of pick up and move there for a while and he'd come here for a while. And then um, we bought our home here in 2017. And we've been really spending more of our time here in Pennsylvania than Denver ever since we bought our home. And we built our studios on our property uh, right after we bought our house. And so our studios are outbuildings on our property. So it's Two buildings, plural. Yes. So we have his and her studios. Really? And, uh, yeah. That's smart. Yeah. You guys are wise. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, uh, we kind of went through a lot of different plans. I mean, building a studio, that was one of the most fascinating and challenging processes of my entire life because I had never thought about, uh, I mean, up until then, uh, we had rented studios and I, I had always been fortunate to have wonderful studios that I've rented, but I've never been able to really sit and think, now, if I could build it from the ground up and customize it to exactly fit my needs. What exactly, how would I design it? What would it be like? And, and what kind of amenities would it have? How much storage would it have? And, you know, so that whole process was really amazing. And um, our house is a whole other story in and of itself. Our, our home is kind of a piece of American history. It was built in 1764. So um, we live in this old limestone house and, um, it's it's a really beautiful historic house and it's on three acres of land and wow. the farmers, yeah the I'm farmer envious. Owner, yeah it's it's a dreamy it's a dreamy place and of course there's there's a lot of maintenance and there's a lot of things that go along with it that um you know we've we've really learned it's been a big learning curve ever since we moved here but the former owner of our home had been uh, an avid master gardener. And so, she, and she was also a painter, which is really interesting because mm. it feels like our house has this lineage that it just wants artists to be in it. But um, so she, you know, our, our house sits on three acres and our studio is at the far end of our property. And there are really extensive gardens all around our home and studio. So um, it's it's been really incredible because neither Kwong or I ever had extensive gardens to take care of. And so we were sort of, it was sort of foisted upon us. We had no idea how extensive it was when we bought the house in the fall. And then the winter came. And then in the spring, all these things just started coming up. I mean, it was incredible. Um, it was a really like a botanical feast. And wow. uh, so it, it's really, really beautiful. So we're, we're learning quite a bit about that. And, uh, um, it's been an inspiration for us, but you know, we, we, we built our studios and we were originally, before we bought our house, we were looking at old farms around Pennsylvania. So we looked at um, a bunch of farms that had old barns in particular. And we were, there was one house in particular that we, we didn't end up getting it, but it was, it had this big, beautiful barn on the property. And we were sort of planning how we could possibly, um, you know, adapt the barn to have, you know, a big wall in between and have lofts and sort of, you know, of course there'd be so much to do to insulate it, even though it was in good condition, but it ended up working out that we didn't have to, uh, 
renovate a pre-existing structure, especially like an old structure, like a barn. Um, it ended up working out so much better for us to just design it exactly as we wanted it. And um, so our studios are on, they're, they're two stories each. And our first floor is kind of like gallery space slash guest space. So we, we both have in the first floor of our studio, a uh, full bathroom and bedroom in there for guests. So that if we have friends or family or other artists, or if we want workshops to host workshops here someday, whatever the case may be. So we have the downstairs is kind of guest space. And then our upstairs is our studio workspace. And um, so we have, you know, our big windows facing true north and it faces our front yard, which is really planted full of trees and, and our, our gardens in front of us. And then across the street, we can see this 22 acre farm that's that's across the road from us. And so, so we're oh, fortunate. right now. Every, it's, it's pretty great. <laughs> However, um, our, this is, you know, about seven miles from where I grew up. So I've watched all of these beautiful farms over the last two decades. You know, I've watched all of these beautiful lands get developed little by mm. little, you know, and, uh, you know, houses and condos and apartment buildings and strip malls and stuff get plumped all over these beautiful farms that I remember as a child. And so this is one, we kind of live in a part of our county that has been relatively untouched by development. And there's all kinds of, local politics battles that have been going on for years to, to keep our area historic and preserved and all that kind of thing. But, but anyway, it's a really special place and, and we really love it. So, it, um, wow. it's inspiring to us. That's amazing. So, and Kwong being from Denver, when the garden popped up without an irrigation system, he must've passed out. That's like, exactly right. Yeah. I think you're a Utah resident, mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you know, and that's the funniest part about it all. He said, oh, my gosh, you don't have to water things here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he did. Yeah. It's, you, have to, you have to keep things at bay because they will, you know, overgrow your entire home if you're not careful. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very lush here. Well, I grew up in New York, so I've had it both ways. And then now I live here in Utah in the desert. So, wow. yeah. Well, that's amazing. Well, I'm really happy for you guys that that worked out. It's Thank really amazing. You. Yeah, yeah, it has been great. We're about to head to Denver um, here in a little, about a week. We're going to uh, head out to Denver for the summer. We, we like spending summers out there and um, we still have a lot of friends and family out there and uh, Kwong's, all of his network are out there and he still has his home and his studio there. So we work out there when we go out for the summer, but um, we just really love it here. Yeah, this is our, this is kind of our home. That's great. So tell me about a little more about your education for your, mas your, your master's program. And how did that, you said that it changed your way of thinking a little bit. Tell me a little bit about that. How did you evolve in that program? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. I think for me to look at uh, the abstract expressionist painters and to ha to be surrounded by a group of people who really prioritize like Joan Mitchell and all of these abstract painters who are really using paint in a more muscly and spontaneous way. I think it, it allowed me the space to make some paintings that were really unconventional for me. And, um, I mean, it's interesting because there's a lot of paintings that I made during those two years in that program that I never showed anyone. And that's for a very specific reason, <laughs> because, um, you know, I wanted to give myself permission to uh, make some paintings that maybe were kind of a train wreck. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think to be in a, in a program where making messy paintings is sort of the standard, it, it <laughs> helps. It, I shouldn't it, laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I that's well, a great quote. <laughs> In a program yeah. where making messy paintings is the standard, I love it. Right. I mean, coming from an atelier background where you are, you know, where I would do a grisaille and an underpainting and a very detailed, you know, and sometimes even doing a preparatory drawing and transferring it. Not all the time, but where I was so methodical and I had planned it out so much. I mean, there were there were times where you know, I would just make paintings that 
I would start with, uh, you know, a simple idea, like something that I saw on a storefront window in Boston as I was walking by. And it's really visually interesting. I really like that, that flower garland. And then, you know, I would, I would paint that in and then think, oh, what is it asking for next? Maybe there's a figure there. Or maybe there's a still life underneath it or, you know, or I'd have a dream where I'd sort of see something in my mind's eye and then, and then I would paint it and I would find references for it, but I would also work from imagination for a little bit. So it was almost like I was working with a like pastiche of bringing sources together mm -hmm. and um, allowing the paintings to be a little more unfinished, a little more messy. And also, you know, the fact that the abstract expressions paintings because they're not representing anything, of course, it's all about design. Um, so it really helped me to think in terms of that aspect of my paintings and um, flattening space a little bit, using pattern a little bit more. Um, you know, I think it just busted me out of my French Academy bubble in a way that was really helpful for me and also experimenting with uh, color. One of my best friends in the program, her name is Ana Valdez, and uh, she's a she just, she's really wild with color and she, her work has a lot of you know, pattern and texture and she's like, she would set up still lifes in her studio that would be like, you know, four different textiles, all of which have these wild colors and patterns. And she's from Northern California. And so, you know, she's used to California foliage and bright mm -hmm. colors and she was an avid gardener too. And so she was just always painting plants and flowers and these kind of tropical looking things. And then vases that had patterns on them and i mean i just uh, admired how um she was not afraid to just put these things together and paint them in flat light and and uh so i i think that was really cool because i just grew up again looking at these academic painters where it's like one you know i had just been studying with frank mason in new york where it's one single light source the shadow is dark it's this kind of numinous Mm -hmm. Dutch face, dark background, you know, dramatic a figure emerging out of the light. So it was just coming into a different visual world for me where, you know, you're looking at like Joan Mitchell's bright, colorful paintings and how explosive the energy is. I think for me, it was just like giving myself permission to make paintings that had a, a more, um, unpredictable energy and working free associatively. Like I made a lot of paintings that I started out having zero idea where it was going to go. And that was completely new for me because I would always plan it out. I would do a drawing. I would do, you know, so it was interesting for me to find that balance of, of planning and working intuitively. Yeah. Would you recommend that people who are academically trained have some exposure to that type of education to be more well-rounded? I, I think so. Or even if it's not a degree program, just studying with someone whose work makes you a little uncomfortable or maybe even someone you admire who you perceive their work to be really different than yours. Because um, mm -hmm. I feel like for me, that was really, uh, I mean, Boston University, that style of painting is very anti-establishment, you know, and so for me, it was like the chaos of me saying who my heroes are and being laughed at for that, you know, and painful as it was, it was like, oh, yeah, I, I need that. There's a whole world of artists out there who, who feel that way and who, you know, really just feel like the most authentic kind of painting is something totally different than what I have been raised to think about by my mentor. And since I had been painting for such a long time, by the time I, you know what I mean? Like I've been, I had been studying in an atelier since I was 11 and I was 25 when I entered that program. So wow. you think of that, you know, almost 15 years of, of very specific education. And then to have it turned on its head was, I think really good for me. And I know I came away with a lot and I, I think it's that way with, with any kind of, with anything in life, really, I think, you know, whether you're having a discussion about um, culture or philosophy or politics or religion and spirituality or whatever, you know, it's just so great to have, 
to be exposed to different viewpoints and people whose paradigm is completely different than yours. And um, yeah, it's just a, it was a gift. Mm. And uh, I think the thing that's interesting about it is that, I mean, I had a terrible, terrible critique, final critique. Um, so like when you finally finish your MFA thesis and you put all your work up in the gallery and, um, you know, they have a, because Boston is so close to New York City, they would have artists from New York who are like in the New York art world, you know, come up and critique your work. So they'd have wow. not just like the faculty, like the, the, faculty of Boston University, but they'd have guest faculty come and, you know, these are people who are like really in it, like really in that art world. And they, they're not hesitant to tell you what they think. And they're not hesitant to, to tear your work to pieces. And, um, I think in a way it sounds terrible, but it's kind of good to be thrown in the lion's den every now and then. Um, because, you know, my undergraduate program, I was encouraged so much. And because my, my work fit in so well with, what the pre-existing paradigm was there. I, I mean, I was challenged, but I wasn't really, really challenged. And I think this was like a time that I was really calling into question everything that I ever believed about art. And, and the thing that was so funny was I remember like, you know, I, I spent a couple of years saving up before I went to graduate school so that I wouldn't be in debt afterwards. And I just remember my final critique was so terrible and it literally, kind of went something like this, like, I don't know what to say about your work. I think I'm just going to move on. There's oh. nothing to say because I can't understand why anyone in there, why any young woman in her 20s, you know, living in the 21st century would want to paint like a 19th century European man. <laughs> like what? Oh, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing for me to talk about here. These have no place in the modern world. Um, and I, I just, you know, he just said, you know, I can't take you seriously. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to even say. And it was funny because I just realized, you know, he was, he was a minimalist artist and um, he was making work with um, found objects. He lived in Brooklyn and he was making these large paintings. And I say paintings with air quotes because they were basically like assemblage on canvas with like detritus that he found in his neighborhood. And he was more of a, you know, like a minimalist found object artist. And so his whole idea about art is like, it should be what's around you. It should be like the immediacy of your surroundings and, you know, to involve yourself with the 19th century or to involve yourself with the history of painting in that way is perverse and uh, anachronistic and, you know, all of that. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I was like, uh, well, according to his viewpoint of what his ultimate values about what art is, he's right. Right. I mean, he's just telling me exactly what, what he thinks about my work. And then I thought, you know, it's funny because that's a lot of what the criticism was about my work is that, you know, I don't feel like this is relatable because it feels like it is standing outside of our time. And for me, I think that was really revealing because it's part of what my goal is in my work is that I, I like that it kind of feels like it doesn't belong to our time, or maybe it feels like it's in an ancient time, or maybe it sort of feels like an alternate world, maybe that doesn't even fit with a particular timeline. Um, but it's just my own personal sense of beauty. And, you know, so I think, I think in a way, like when somebody tells you how they're interpreting your work, you're like, well, what they hate about my work is actually what I love about my work. And you now I've, I've told this story before, and I think it's part of what was so interesting about my experience there at BU. But in that final critique, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber collects pre Raphaelite art and um, art that's inspired by the 19th century. And one of my great life dreams has always been to have a piece in Andrew Lloyd Webber's personal collection. <laughs> so nobody really knew that in my program, but in my final critique, this artist from New York who was critiquing my work and just tearing my work to shreds, he just said, I mean, this work looks like it belongs in the 
collection of Andrew Lloyd Webber or something. Oh, <laughs> right? gosh, are you serious? He was like meaning it as the biggest insult. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. That is my <laughs> greatest dream for my work. <laughs> It's like he smacked you in the face and you're just like, oh gosh, no one's ever yeah. touched me that way. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. too funny. <laughs> yeah, like it's the greatest gift. But I just remember that was the week before I graduated and um, it was such chaos. And I, and I should also note that a couple days, so there was like a couple days between my final grad critique which was so horrible, and then um, and my graduation, and uh, I was just in a bad place. And then a couple of days later was when the Boston Marathon bombing happened. Wow! Um, and so, so I mean, that was it was just a, I mean, and then the whole manhunt that ensued. I mean, it was like a, a wild time to yeah. be living in Boston and. Uh, I just, I felt like everything was in chaos. And then, you know, I graduated and, um, and I thought, you know, you know, so then I moved back to Pennsylvania because I was just, it was like, I was a wounded animal. I yeah, so I bet. So I want to, I got to, I got to poke and prod on this one a little bit. Cause so I, I feel like a broken record. People who listen to these podcasts back and back might be irritated, but I always say this, um, but I'm, it's something I didn't expect is how much I'm learning from all of the people I'm interviewing. And what I'm already learning from you is just this, how that I need a better attitude. <laughs> like oh. you have such a great attitude about your, about the things that have happened to you. Um, I don't sense a resentment or anything. It seems like you came out of it. it, it you turned it into a positive experience. So yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Um, I had, I had similar experiences with lousy education. My, my, I mean, my education track was very different than yours, but I certainly had teachers that were postmodern, you know, uh, had very different philosophy and very different tastes than me and yeah. also had very bad critiques. And I can say I didn't come out of it in such a positive way like you did. So, so wow, it's amazing. <laughs> So I want to ask you this, like, how did that affect your future work? Or is it, or were you already established at that point? Is the work that I'm looking at on your website and that I'm familiar with, is that what it looked like at the time? Were you already starting to develop who you are? Or did critiques like that and other experiences bring you to where you are today? Yeah, I think I was really well on my way to where... I currently am. Um, but I think one of the things that I was really inspired to do was also another thing that was brought up to me in critique was like, um, you know, I need to believe in this world you're creating. Um, it's almost like when you read a really, really good novel, the reason why it's so good is the world building, right? The person has taken the time to really describe the world and, the, and the, you know, the creatures in it and the, the environment is really richly detailed and the language that's spoken or not spoken, you know, it's just a very uh, loved and well thought out craft. And um, I think for me, you know, I was, I sort of thought about my paintings as almost like a stage where it was a subject in front of a backdrop, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, when I look at my older paintings, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't see it. You know, the, the, the problem is really obvious, but I didn't really do a good job of integrating the space in the figure because I didn't think about them as one thing. I thought about like the subject is the juicy figure in the foreground and then everything else is just the background. And um, one of the things about a lot of the abstract expressionist painters starting with Cezanne. I mean, most people kind of credit Cezanne with the beginning of abstract expressionist painting because he compressed space and made space, the foreground and the background were conflated. And you got this sense of just a tapestry of visual information that's all integrated. And I have to say, I don't like Cezanne's paintings. Like I don't, I don't take pleasure in seeing them, but I really appreciate them. Like I really like 
what they meant for art history. And I, I am amazed by all the artists that are inspired by him. And so I think that integration was really big for me because even when you look at Bouguereau's paintings, I mean, not to, you know, insult the hero of so many, but he, you, you look at the figure and then the environment that it's in feels a little um, secondary, or it, it feels a little like, as my one of my professors would say, the background is decoration. So it kind of feels like there's this stage, the figures are on the stage, and then the the landscape around them or whatever space is around them feels sort of like an afterthought and like they can't kind of rush it. And in a lot of academic painting, I see that nowadays too, where I look at the figure, it's so beautifully painted, but then it feels like there's just this scene behind, whether it's the figure, the still life, whatever the, the quote subject is, and the space kind of feels, it almost feels like the artist just was getting it over with, like rushing it. Um, and for me, looking at these abstract painters who are good, only the good abstract painters, I'm not talking about bad ones, right. but the ones that are really good, you see that every part of the painting is paid attention to. And that doesn't mean that every part of the painting is fussy or that every part of the painting is overworked. It just means that there's there's attention to like this space over here and this space over here and how this thing relates to this thing. And, you know, there's no background or foreground. The empty space is just as important and intentional as the, the filled space. And so there's no such thing as negative space. It's all just important visual information that is parts that make up the whole, if that makes sense. Um, oh, I hope absolutely. That mumbo jumbo, but well, but, um, for yeah. Me, um, you know, I've become much more. It sounds like a corny word to say loving, but I've become much more loving about the entire painting. I mean, when I do a painting, and I've become, oh my gosh, Jeff, you wouldn't believe how slow I am. I was looking at your website, and I was like, how does this man have a wife and children and make all of these? You're so prolific. I have oh no my idea. gosh, I'm not prolific, but that's nice of you to say. Yeah. No, I'm just older than you. That's all. No. <laughs> I'm just 10 I, years older. No, you are incredibly prolific. I was looking at that and thinking, my gosh, it's unbelievable how, how deliberate and fast you are. And I just, I take so long on my paintings now. And I know it sounds funny because you might think as an artist, as you get older, you'd think, well, you get better at this thing, you get more confident, you blow through your paintings faster. But for me, I just, I've really slowed down. And in the last few years, you know, I put out so, so many fewer, so, so few paintings a year because I just don't want to let a painting out that feels like it's not a hundred percent treated with care. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's almost like, I get to a point where I say to myself, I could be done now. And I think there are a lot of artists who would look at this and say, you're done, move on. Um, you know, but I'm like this area here could be so much more beautiful or like this passage here, there was a painting that I recently did and I had a deadline on it and there's a big figure in the front and there's a floral element. And uh, on the left-hand side was like this passage of the painting that I intended to sort of be just a vague sky area. But when I finished the rest of the painting, like I spent so much time and love on the rest of the painting and I just planned to finish it. Then I, I looked at it and that area there was, I was like, I just said to myself, you know, that is the one part of this painting that doesn't feel like it belongs to the rest of the painting. It feels really uncared for. I, it kind of feels like I just cared about everything else and then rushed this mm -hmm. and that's what's gonna stand out, you know, when people look at this painting, it's like, what, what, did you lose interest there or something? And so I spent another couple days painting a landscape back there that was detailed and uh, had like really deep space. And when it was done, my gosh, I loved it. I was so happy with oh, this good. painting. I felt like it was, it was worth that extra couple of days. And it actually put me past the deadline and I begged for extra time. and. But it was just one of those things where I, I was so glad that I spent the extra time to really care for the whole painting because it just showed and it, and it took it from, you know, a work that was, you know, 
pretty good to being a work that is really one of my best. And I think, you know, really that to me, even though my works are so far from abstract expressionism and, and, but it's like that philosophy of, of paying attention to every space in the painting and really thinking about the design. And um, I often also start my paintings with a particular design in mind. Like I, uh, it'll often be like, okay, well, I want it to be like a serpentine shape. So I want the, you know, like all the yellows to flow in this direction, or I want, I want all of the light to kind of really be here and then nothing else will be as light as that so that really this pattern of light can move through the painting in this way or that way. So really just like learning how to move your eye through the painting. And Wait, so let me painting, stop you there for a sec. So are you saying that you sometimes work out these patterns of light, dark, and color before you even know what your subject is? Sometimes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like right now I have a big painting on my easel and I had, I had done um, two small abstract paintings and the painting on my easel is based on one of these abstract paintings that I did. So really that's yeah. great. Yeah. So it, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, I guess it, I guess the abstract expressionism made its way into my life more than I even indicated, but yes. Um, there's these paintings also, th these two abstract paintings I did, um, they're gonna become floral paintings ultimately, but I worked out the palette and the design. So one has a lot more like reds and greens, and the other one has blue and purples and greens, but it's like the the chroma, the, the way the darks and lights are structured in it. Um, I worked that stuff out in advance, so that kind of helps and one of the transformative shows that I saw was a couple of years ago, I went to go see this Edwin Dickinson show at, uh, it was a small show. I mean, he didn't, I don't think he was that prolific. He didn't paint a whole lot of work, but it was a small show of his at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And those paintings, they were multi-figure paintings, but they were so abstract. It was like, it was almost like he made a collage with black and white mm -hmm. and then just, put the figures and the environment into it. Really? So, yeah, you just got this sense when you're standing back, they almost look like Robert Motherwell paintings, like the black and white pattern and how graphic they were. But then- Were they monochromatic? You know, you guess, yeah, very monochromatic. Um, they were kind of like all in this grayscale plus a little bit of blue and flesh. So they didn't really have a ton of color. They were really, there were just a lot of, dark blacks mm -hmm. and kind of white whites and uh you know you got up close and it's like well there's a there's a city scene and there's you know a child with a violin and then there's a cat and then there's an old woman and there's all this stuff going on and maybe there's an implied narrative or maybe it's from a dream ad or whatever it is but the design is just so good you can't look away so <laughs> i've been thinking a lot about him and uh that sort of philosophy of making paintings and yeah so i'm really interested in this approach that you have in this in where you've arrived um you know because for me it feels like i feel like a product of my time and mm -hmm. this what i mean by this is uh so you know painting was invented in the early renaissance and then it, it, it you know it was sort of uh, sort of simplistic, sort of juvenile, you know, looking right. at the time. Yeah, right. And then it got mm -hmm. more and more advanced. By the time they're in the 17th century, people are really designing these great canvases, these large multi-figure canvases with these unbelievable, you know, designs. Right. But they also had the academic drawing skills. I mean, at this point, they've already mastered perspective. They'd mastered figure drawing and painting. So now it's like they're getting into some really hard stuff, right? In the 19th right. century, it just explodes because they have the camera, but then right. it all dies and everyone's a modernist for the 20th right. century. And I just feel like what I mean by a product of our time is that we're, I, I feel like we're just sort of trying to reinvent realism again. Mm -hmm. And it's really tempting to just think about making, to just be satisfied with just knowing how to do it. 
Right. Do you know what I mean? And that's it. Like, look yeah. what I can do. Look, because because everyone in the 19th century could only make shapes, but look what I can do. And so, and then they throw out, not not they, I'm speaking about myself. It's tempting to just throw right. out all the design and just think, oh, I can paint a beautiful portrait. Um, right. Yeah. So I think this is really cool what you're saying and that, and that this education really helped you to think in terms of a flat plane and design yeah. that plane and then put your subject into that. So that the subject is secondary to the secondary to the design is that's what I think I'm hearing you say. Yes, yeah, that's right, that's right, and that is a, a very new development in my work as far as you know my graduate school experience at, at, at Boston University, and then also I took a workshop with Zoe Frank uh, back in 2020, and she's oh, just she's incredible. a master with this. She really is, and uh, that's the reason I took her workshop because I was like, you know, I still at in graduate school they told me that that, you know, it was hinted at, I knew that this is kind of where I needed to go, but I, I just, I need to learn from the master. Like she is doing it in a way that is so good. The integration of, of, uh, you know, masterful painting and realism and the rendering of the forms and the color and all that stuff is really great, obviously, but, but it's like the structure of how she puts a painting together and how she plays a space. I think that's what's so interesting about it is that the conflation of it, it's like, whatever's in the background and the foreground are equally interesting and everything is equally paid attention to. And, and there's, uh, it's, it's all about structure for her. And I think that was so interesting to me is like you said, you know, where you go through the centuries and from the invention of oil painting and the early Flemish masters to where they're just trying to figure out how to render surfaces, you know, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and then, you know, you move towards, towards the Renaissance and the Baroque and, and you get the drama of like dark and light and compositions, like you said. Um, and I think the thing that's so cool about the way Zoe teaches is that she had us do master copies in gouache with only black and white. So just two values. Oh. And then choose a painting that you love, like whatever it is, it doesn't matter what painting it is. You just have to really respond to it. And, uh, you know, and then paint just, all maybe two or three values, you know, just all grayscale and, uh, and paint it and, and don't think about what the forms are. It's just the darks, the darks and lights and how they move your eye through the painting. So she was talking about like structure and then we had to get on there and kind of analyze our painting. Like, what is it about the structure of this painting? If you strip it of the subject matter, the mythological, religious, political subject matter, whatever it is, um, look at the structure. And so, you know, I did, um, Titian's Assumption of the Virgin Mary. I've always loved that painting, but I never really looked at it as as for that black and white, you know, structure of how it's how the painting is built and what's so interesting about it and how, you know, he creates this layer cake of like building up from the bottom and and the, how the forms kind of peak at the top and how he leads the eye through the painting and um, it's just a really fascinating painting when looked at that way too. And I just thought, wow. What a great way to think about um, your paintings, you know, and how you're how you're moving the eye. And um, I mean, it was just just mind blowing, and and uh, it gave me. I feel like it just gave me years worth of material to think about because uh, it takes so long. And and um, the other thing is that I am not a tech savvy artist at all, and so. I've always kind of wanted to experiment with using digital means in my work more, um, you know, and I know how to do. What some do you, what do you mean by that? Just like implementing Photoshop or something or. Yeah. So using Photoshop in a, in a more heavy way than just like, Oh, I took this hand from this painting from this uh, photograph and I put it onto, you know, cause like I didn't like this hand in one photo. So like for a portrait oh, okay. commission, I'll be like, Oh, I, would rather use this hand from this photo, cut it out, put it on. That's a kind of a basic thing that I know how to do. But I, I thought, you know, I'd love to be able to use, you know, do a compositional abstract study and then scan it in and use it as like an amateur, like an armature for a painting. And then, and then take my photo reference and put it in and splice it up and maybe like play with it in that way. And mm. so um, I, I recently took a private, just a, a four session private course with my friend Nancy Vaz, who is teaching Photoshop for artists, just uh, one on one kind of private instruction. And so I took some some classes with her to kind of learn how to use Photoshop a little bit because 
I know that if I, if I had more comfort and knowledge with Photoshop and knew how to use all the tools, I would be able to plan out so much more of this before I even step in front of the canvas. And to me, that's drawing. I mean, to me, that's making preparatory drawings and um, using that to your advantage. And so that's yeah. kind of my next part here is figuring out how, and I don't know how to use um, Procreate or any of those either. And I would love to learn how to use that. So that's something that I yeah. think... Next. A lot of artists are doing that now. I mean, there's many artists that I know that do their entire painting digitally. Um, they'll yeah. even use 3D software to create buildings and even figures and everything before they ever touch paint to canvas. Um, but one person you should look up is David Dibble. Okay, so David Dibble, I was actually going to mention him to you five seconds ago. Okay, <laughs> okay. He's awesome. I met him when I did a, a visiting artist uh, workshop at BYU and okay. um, he, he's awesome. So I, I love his work. He's the kindest man ever. And um, he and I actually had a brief conversation about uh, that I might want to study with him on Zoom um, just to, to learn his, because he were, used to work in the gaming industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so he said, hey, you know, if that's something you're interested in, let's talk about that. So he's actually been like on my mind lately, like, I think I, I think I need to just uh, talk to David Dibble. Yeah, you should. Yeah, he. I think he uses Procreate and an iPad, and he does numerous color studies for his uh, landscape paintings before he actually paints them, and um, yeah, works really well for him. So it's fascinating. I just saw he posted on Instagram like his he posted his photo reference, and then he posted like how he altered it, and mm -hmm. then he posted final painting. So you kind of see like how he works with the imagery and it was, it was awesome. It was so imaginative and I loved seeing that. So yes, you're right. I'm, this is reinforcement. <laughs> well, I'm not suggesting <laughs> it because you need it. I'm suggesting it because he's someone who's a master with technology. So he he's seems really good. He is. Yeah. He knows his stuff. So, okay. So let's look at some of your art a little bit here. So, and I have, my first question is this. So clearly you are gifted with design. And so, you know, you're talking about how much this interests you, how important it is to you. Well, you're backing it up. I mean, your work shows that you're clearly interested in it because it, you're, it's very strong, but Thank you. subject matter also seems important to you. Is that just Thank my you. imagination or is there, am I right? Because yeah, it doesn't, it, it, these don't just feel like they're about design. They feel like more than that to me. Thank you. Yeah, hmm. I so appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, it is, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously the design and the, the mood that you want to evoke. I think sometimes for me, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm noticing that, um, I mean, I, I recently redesigned my website, and I think for me, the thing that was so instructive about that was that I was trying to decide whether or not to divide my website by genre. Um, yeah. So uh, I was thinking like, okay, I want to have you know, all my figures here, all my still life here, all my landscape here. I don't think you should. Thing. And I thought, you know what? Um, I <laughs> not that you're asking my opinion. I'm glad you reinforced that because, um, you know, I've been kind of kicking it back and forth, but I actually, the thing that I like so much about um, the, the the kind of genreless website is that for me, I, I try to perceive my work like that actually is I, I, I'm trying hard to perceive it beyond genre. And I think that's a hard thing to do, especially as, like you said, academically trained artists who, you know, you think about the the 19th century salons and it was like ca by category, you know, you'd have the mythological category and there was even, you know, a widely disseminated belief about the, the hierarchy of important painting, right? You'd have the, the highest painting would be religious and mythological and then the second highest would be portraiture and then, and then below that you'd have, um, you know, maybe still landscape life. and then still yeah. life, you know, yeah. and so it was, was kind of like this this hierarchy that I imagined. And as I was learning how to paint, it was like, well, you know, if you can learn how to paint the figure and if you can learn how to paint it in a space that feels, you know, 
that has like a narrative space and it's complex, then, then, you know, you've really nailed it. But the thing is, I, I want, whether it's a, you know, floral still life or whether it's a landscape, you know, I really want it to have, it, it's kind of about the mood that I'm trying to evoke. And I, and I was looking around my studio at all my paintings that I, ha I have a whole bunch of studies just all over my, my studio wall right now. And, and they're uh, figure studies and they're also landscapes and, and just a little bit of everything. And, you know, I, I held up one painting to another painting and the, both of these paintings were sort of in this blue palette that I intentionally pushed the palette towards blue. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm realizing that it's not about this particular landscape. I mean, it is, that's the kind of the initial jumping off point for me, but it's really about like the mood that I'm trying to evoke and like this specific time of day and this specific season. And, and so um, for me is kind of, kind of like that where I want, I want, uh, you know, my florals and everything to just kind of feel like it's part of the same, um, colorful, abundant earth. <laughs> so, yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's my perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And that there are painters that paint figure landscape still life. And then there are painters <laughs> like you, yeah, I don't you. see your stuff as different. I don't see them as different subjects because you have such a distinct color palette and a distinct sensibility that they don't seem like they need to be categorized. They all fit into the same category. Um, now, if Thank I were to you. paint landscape and then figure, it might need to be separated because I don't mm -hmm. have this distinct of uh, sensibility, I don't think. But and Thank you. yeah, I mean, it's, they definitely belong together. I don't see them as different. So I pulled up this one here and I have a question about it, but I have a yes. question about all of your work, but this thing is unbelievable. Another Thank thing, so another much. thing that's been driving me crazy about this podcast, is like, I wish I could buy the stuff I'm looking at. I mean, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure this is sold. It's so beautiful. Um, yes, Thank it is you. private collection. That sucker. Can I get their address? I, so I can go get that painting. <laughs> but well, we need to work out a trade someday. That Maybe would be amazing. Can... Let's do that. Um, so here's my question. It's and it's personal. Yeah. Um, but the trick that I find the the difficulty I find in painting with lots of color is making a painting too busy or too garish. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't do that. Yeah. And you have more oh, color. Thank you. You have more color than any painter I know and more saturated, more, more diversity of color, more diversity of hue. It's so chromatic and yet it's not garish. You probably can't Thank answer you. this. So my question is how, I know you probably can't answer that because it's probably, oh. it's probably very intuitive, but can you at least comment on it? Is there something you can offer with that? you so much first of all thank you so much that means so much coming from you jeff and um i think uh, co my color sensibility is you know of course color is such a personal choice and every artist has their kind of personal go-to palette and um, i'm glad that you don't think it's garish because no. um sometimes i look at my work and i'm like oh gosh I, corny as hell like what no <laughs> it's like i don't know how um you know sometimes i'm like oh it's so over the top and Maybe I should rein it in, you know, here or there, but um, I just, I really do love um, luscious color. And I think a big part of it, honestly, is um, my mom is an interior designer and she's, she's also painting now and she's doing abstract paintings and she has an incredible eye for color and texture and design. And I think just watching her from the time I was a child, I mean, obviously I had been painting classically since I was a child and, um, uh, my mom was, I mean, my mom is such a great designer. So to see her choose, um, colors to put together and <clears throat> see the kind of vision that she would have for like, she, she would just make really, really bold choices in a room that I would never have thought of. And then to see them together, I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's really incredible. And even like scale, like the way she'll, um, choose textiles to go in a room and what she would choose for the couch versus what she would choose for the, the, the window treatments is like, you've got a big pattern 
and you've got a small pattern and whatever you're going to see from across the room has to be graphic and because it has to like hold its own, you know? And so for me, it's like how to choose, like, uh, you know, I, I want a big expanse of yellow to show from across the room. And then I want really small pieces of yellow, you know? So like the, the, I would say like the drapery and then kind of the bits of yellow that are in those yellow roses on the right hand side and, and the bits of it that are on that, that, decaying sunflower up in the upper left and kind of how, um, you know, kind of the larger bits of red. And then as it kind of goes down, it cascades into those really tiny little roses that are sort of, uh, it's like a, in a symphony, it's like the piccolo and the bass drum. And like, you have all these different kind of sounds and movements in the painting. So I'm always trying to work with that. And then as far as color, I think uh, for me, honestly, because I respond so viscerally to color and I, I love it so much, um, I'm always trying to think of how to get the most out of a red. Like if I put a red down, how do I get the most out of that red? And, and um, I think, you know, in this painting, maybe the example would be, I could have painted that sky as it was. Um, the, the background, the, the landscape behind her, I did it from a study that I did on site in, um, in Provence, when Kwong and I were there a couple of years ago, and the sky was really like this cobalt cool blue. Like it was a very cool blue, but I really pushed it towards green because pushing it towards that green really makes the, the red come alive in a way that is, um, it's almost like it just tweaks the optic nerve a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I think in a way, it's not so much the colors I'm using, but it's like intentional choices of how to juxtapose them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. thing, one thing I'm noticing about this painting as I'm studying it, cause I'm trying to figure you out. Like I want to, I want to understand this, your brain so that I can kind of absorb your powers, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like what I'm noticing is you're very, the whole painting, while they're very chromatic colors, you are pushing most stuff in the direction of warmth um, yeah. with few exceptions, but actually maybe those aren't even exceptions. Even your blues lean slightly violet. And, yeah. and I wonder if that's part of what the key is in this particular painting is that you're not using the entire color wheel. You're kind of you're taking at least however large you're taking a slice of it. And I mean, do you think about that or is that, is that not what you're doing or is it, or maybe is this just intuitive and you didn't know you were doing it? Yeah. A lot of it is discovering it as I go along too. Um, I wish I, I wish I had some detailed close up shots of this painting too, because there's some specific color choices that are hard to talk about without zooming in. But I think, yeah. um, you know, one of one of the things is is I, I do figure it out as I go quite a bit. Like um, I, I think, kind of toning toning certain colors to fit the world of this painting. Like this world, I really I really did want it to feel like this harvest, this like late summer, early autumn mood of like abundance and harvest and the things that are blooming and the things that are dying. And it's actually, um, this painting, I worked on it for a very long time in spurts, like stolen moments. And I actually started this painting a couple days after my son was born. So we came home from the hospital and sorry to like interject personal stuff because you asked about technical stuff. But anyway, No, I want to hear I, about it. I had this, uh, I had been wanting to do this, this sort of abundant painting and it is, I mean, it was just a very abundant time of my life. And I wanted to paint about what that mood was like. You mean and being I do newly have... married, having a child, a new home. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. All of, all of those things that were kind of happening in my life. So it's just like this um, sort of overflow of gratitude. And how do I, how do I put that in painting form? Just how, how I would interpret that. And, um, and really like not just the subject, but the, the overall atmosphere of, of the painting and and you know i want the painting itself to feel like a gift that i'm offering too like i want there to be a lot to look at and i want it to be for the viewer a lot you know a lot of really wonderful things to see that um 
that not just like upon a cursory glance, which obviously on the internet is is the way most people are seeing it. But um, I just wanted it to be something that just offers more and more to look at that when not just from across a room, but as you get closer and closer, it invites you to keep getting closer. Oh, yeah, it um, does. Even in this scale. I mean, all the little flies and the beetle on the tree and the, the moth up here. And it's just, there's so much to look at. That little dragonfly, not just the bugs, of course, but even just every flower. I keep going back to this upside down. I guess that's a sunflower. sunflower. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, what a great choice to turn that upside down. It makes it so much more interesting. But the predictable thing would have been to have another sunflower. Like everyone knows what the front of a sunflower looks like. So why not paint the front of a sunflower? No, you turn it upside down and it makes it much more interesting. Um, yeah, there's a lot to look at here. And I hope the client knows what they have because this is, um, not only is it beautiful, but when it represents such an abundant time in your life, they probably don't yes. know how significant this painting is. To them, it's just beautiful. And it makes me want it even more, dang it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it, thank you. Yeah. Well, this painting had a very special, um, had kind of a special debut because it was, um, Art Renewal Center has a an ongoing relationship with Sotheby's Auction House in New York City. And oh. so um, without going too much, Kara Ross is sort of, she was hand selecting uh, a couple artists to be a part of the contemporary art auction uh, in Sotheby's in New York City because um, their, the goal of Art Renewal Center, of course, is to um, bring contemporary realism into the mainstream contemporary art world so that we're not kind of this enclave over here of of artists working in this specific tradition but really that we're part of the the ongoing conversation of contemporary realism so um i think it's just really really awesome you know their mission is really great but i i was honored that she she invited um six seven artists i believe internationally to be a part of this auction so wow so what an it honor did, it, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful honor to be invited. And um, so it did sell at the Sotheby's auction, which is a really, a really cool thing. And, um, and it was nice to also have a deadline because as you know, uh, with your, with your own family, you're always balancing mm -hmm. um, you know, life, life as a dad. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, it's been, it's been really wonderful. Um, you know, obviously it's, beyond what anyone could articulate, right? Becoming a, a parent is just the greatest blessing and the greatest gift and the most transformative thing that can happen in your life. But um, it, 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 was, it was definitely an adjustment. And, you know, without going into it too much, my son is now a toddler. So it's a different season because when he was an infant and he slept so much more and I just had him in my studio with me, all the time and i was i had him in his little carrier while i was standing at the easel or he'd be sleeping or he'd be in his little bouncy seat or he'd be in his playpen or whatever the case may be and now he wants to get at everything mm -hmm. you know he wants to open every cabinet he wants to open every drawer he wants to dump over every trash can and s sort through all the contents he wants to put his finger in every socket <laughs> you know electrical socket so it's like uh, overnight, I feel like as soon as he learned to crawl, really, as soon as he turned one, it was like, uh, I felt that dramatic change in my productivity and my focus. So when, when yeah. he was an infant, I was like, always, you know, I was, I was working so much more than I am now. And I had so much more focus. So I was grateful to be able to like fit in a couple large paintings before he became a toddler. <laughs> so mm -hmm. he's 15 months now. And the last couple of months have been an adjustment, but, um, you know, um, to be honest, you know, the last couple months I've been working on uh, portrait commissions and I have three more portrait commissions ahead of me, but I'm also working on a, a passion project that involves my son um, in a really direct way. I'm, I'm can't say too much about it, but he is involved in the painting. And so it's a, it's a pretty big painting. So I'm working on that in stolen moments. And then I have these portrait commissions, which I've promised to clients and they're very gracious about it. So thankfully I don't, there's not a huge rush there, but then there's another show that I'm preparing for in October um, and I'm doing these big floral paintings for it. So I always have like a number of things on the easel and um, 
I mean, it's just been the most uh, fascinating year of awakening ever. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, uh, I feel so much more inclined um, to make paintings that are about really beauty as motive um, because I have, I'm, there's less, there's a little less angst in my life than there used to be just, you know, the, the joy of a married and family life and, um, and our home and, and just kind of this wonderful new chapter. And so my latest paintings really are just kind of about joy and abundance and, um, being grateful for what's, what's going on in my life. And, um, so I think, I think for me, you know, doing these floral paintings that I'm working on right now, they're a little bit of a switch from the figurative, but, um, they're all, um, based on flowers that are growing in our in our garden so um we have things that are kind of always on rotation so as soon as april and may come things start sprouting of course so we've got in may the month of may we had our irises and um you know all of our azaleas and uh, all of these other you know beautiful florals that come to our property every year and then there's also, our neighbors have some really beautiful gardens. And so I've been basically creating these fantasy garden paintings that are just, I'm basically taking flowers from all these different sources. Um, and they're all like local flowers that are, that are blooming at the same time. And I'm putting them together in one canvas and trying to make them feel like they're growing in the same garden. So talk about combining source material. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's kind of an interesting challenge for me. And, and I, it's funny because I said to Kwong, you know, I, I'm just dying to paint these flowers and I love, I love painting figures and I, I specifically, I love painting women and, and, um, but I, I just feel this longing to paint specifically flowers and, um, I said, you know, you've got all of these incredible flower painters that, you know, that I admire so much and, and, uh, you know, Daniel Keyes and Katie Whipple and all these artists that are kind of in our world that paint flowers and paint them primarily. And I said, you know, I just feel like it's hard to just compare with those artists and, and it just feels like, oh, what could I, what could I say about flowers that they haven't already said? But Kong was like, that's the complete wrong motive, you know? Mm, yeah, <laughs> like, I agree. It's hard to do this. And, uh, you know, you want to celebrate these these flowers, then then do it. And to me, it's almost like a study in, in, it really is a study in color and texture because these irises, all of them have different markings and, and they're fascinating. And each of these... Um, you know, these foxgloves that we have growing are, they're all different colors and the spots inside and some of the flowers are bugle shaped and then the blue delphinium are conical, but then they have like these flatter flowers with markings on the inside. I mean, it's just really fascinating. So I'm sort of using what I've learned about design from painting the figure and bringing it into these florals. Well, and, and your flowers control. are going to look completely different than other artists. I mean, you have such a unique palette. So thank you. Tell me about your palette. It looks like you looks like you have phthalo, like phthalo green, phthalo blue. Yeah. So um, I don't use black. Um, okay. I don't use black or, or any of the earth colors. I don't use umber. I just use a full chromatic palette so that I just mix. Like if I need to use, if I need to darken something, I don't use black. I use whatever the complement of that color is mm -hmm. and, and just a darker value. And then, um, so my palette is basically, and I do use, I mean, I guess this is kind of a shameless plug, but I do honestly use mostly Sennelier paint and some of the colors that I use are, are only made by them. Um, and then some, you know, and I, I use some, there's some really beautiful Michael Harding colors that I use too, like Amethyst uh, is a beautiful purple that I use for the shadows because it's kind of transparent and it's extremely chromatic and, and rich and beautiful. But um, there's some, yeah, there's some colors that I, I feel are maybe kind of unique to my palette that when people refer to my palette, maybe it's these particular colors like barite green 
Uh, is that is what that green is? Color? It's not phthalo, that green I keep seeing? It's so chromatic. Yeah, that, so barite green is that very cool light green, almost like a seafoam green that I use in the flesh a lot. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, like, so a lot of these paintings, um, and some of these paintings, it's funny, I'm looking back at these old paintings. I mean, these are from like 2014, 2015. Let me go and a back lot of to these your, are, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, a lot of these I've worked back into. <laughs> like, some of these don't really look that much like that anymore because I worked back into them. But you can see my older work is not quite as chromatic as the newer work, so I've been figuring out color um, gradually. But um, Yeah, that, and I, I love the chroma of your new work. Thank, thank you so much. Um, using uh, just kind of straight colors too. Like I don't really, I don't really over mix. Like I never really mix more than two colors together. Um, I use a lot, like for, for this one actually in the highlight is lead tin yellow, lead tin yellow light by Michael Harding. And it's almost like uh, if you took neon yellow and mixed it with white, like it's an extremely cool chromatic white. And I'm very sensitive to those temperature shifts. So I'm, I'm very interested in your palette. Some I'm going to send you an email. Would you mind sending me some of these colors? Yeah, yeah I'd love. Yeah, I'm very course. interested um, because, because my palette is very chromatic as well. And yeah. I'm always I don't I also don't use earth tones. I like just pure chroma. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, you're talking too. about colors I've never even heard of. So I'm interested oh, in trying wow. some of them. Yeah. Good. I I'm so glad to have told you something that that you may not have known. That's so cool. I the the barite green is really great, and so is um, permanent green by Sennelier. Permanent is that green. this? Is that the barite green on this painting, Evelyn Nesbitt? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's either. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm pretty sure that's permanent green, and then I use barite green in a lot of the transitional, kind of like that liminal space between the shadows in the light where it goes the flesh goes a little grayer mm -hmm. um so for this for this painting for example yeah back up, I mean, I, back up. okay yeah i'm using mostly sennelier colors so there are phthalos in the in the back and then you know like in the like those those white hollyhocks in the areas where there's blue there's like king's blue which is made by sennelier and then you know i mix a little bit of you know, cad yellow into it to kind of make it warmer in those areas. And then um, permanent green light is what I use for the highlights on those buds. So there's, you know, that's a really like tennis ball green almost, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I mixed it with a little cad yellow to warm it up a little bit. So to me, it's just like cooking. Um, you're adding a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you're tasting it. And as you go along, you kind of just decide um, what you need and, and kind of deciding, like, for example, as you know, that, that painting that we're looking at right now, the hollyhocks. So this is called Denver hollyhocks for those listening. Yes. Yeah. So it's, I went to the Denver Botanic Gardens and I did a study from life and I, uh, I intended to paint the entire thing from life, but this, I just didn't, I wasn't that into the study, but it gave me it, it gave me some more information, which helped with this. Um, you know, I think the more information you have, the more you can invent. I know that sounds really weird, but um, this painting, for example, like the transition in if you look at the, the background space, those those kind of trees in the mm -hmm. background um, as it moves down, I wanted it to kind of move from you know light blue to green to that purple at the bottom. Um, so that, you know, that the green of the buds at the bottom is popping differently against that dark purple in yeah. the background, you know, and the way it, it kind of pops differently against that pale blue at the top. Um, and just, just kind of like the push pull of, uh, light against dark, dark against light. And, um, so, and, and I started this painting with a palette knife. That's another thing that's kind of important is, is often when I start a painting, um, I'll start with a palette knife and also the figurative piece, Demeter, the piece that we were just talking about before with the yellow. Um, I painted that, I blocked the whole thing in with a palette knife. 
And I feel like that's an important thing to mention because it just makes you so much more decisive about color. Hmm. Um, and and I, I kind of learned that through uh, some artists that I study with, um, John, John Ebersberger and uh, Rick Casali, who's a friend of mine. And he's well known as a sculptor, but before he was a sculptor, he was painting really prolifically. And I, I took his workshop, but both of those guys are students of Henry Henchy and the Cape Cod School of Art. So there's a whole lineage there. Um, uh, so it's, you know, the whole philosophy behind it is a full chromatic palette, painting out in full sunlight, um, you know, so I, and, and painting with a palette knife, using a palette knife at least to, to block in because it forces you to make a decision about color. You know, when you've got that brush up there and you're not quite sure what, to what color you're looking at. And so you just say, oh, I'll just kind of smudge it on there like this. But when you ha are using a palette knife, you have to mix up that color and you have to say, you know, what is that? So mm. when I took um, John Ebersberger's workshop and also uh, Rick Casali too, we painted still lifes outside. So it was a bunch oh. of still life options. And then, you know, sitting on a table that had colored construction paper underneath it on a full, 90 degree sunny day. So you've got the sun shining down on the objects that you're painting, the reflected light from the colored surface bouncing back into it. And then you're painting with a palette knife on panel. So I would say that was a big turning point for me too, because learning how to say, okay, that's not just a shadow. It's not just darker in value, but it's reflecting what's around it. So it's in relationship with what's around it. You know, if I take away that pink piece of paper that's underneath it, it's going to be a totally different thing, you know, that everything is affected by what's around it and the colors are going to be affected by what's reflecting into the, you know, the object and the way that light is bouncing around. So I'd say that that was a really big thing for me. And then uh, they graciously invited me to paint with them uh, for a couple of weeks, one summer up in Cape Cod, um, where they all go and, and paint during the summer. And that's kind of the birthplace of that whole Henshi school and those ideas about painting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, there's, yeah, there's a little bit more about that lineage and the other associated artists that I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about, like, I think maybe, don't quote me on this, I think maybe Nelson Shanks. I don't know. Yeah. A Henshi student, or I'm not 100% sure. I but think they use his, or they at least discuss his palette there. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's because, yes, it, yeah. in Kaminati, it's, it's all about- I'm sorry, yeah, at a studio Kaminati, right. Yeah, yeah, and Kaminati is all about the specific color shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and I never said that in Kaminati, but I feel like I got the idea from the same place, which is that kind of philosophy of, of um, building a painting using color shifts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd say that that was, that was a turning point for me too. And, and also, you know, the thing that we would do is take a model out on the beach in Cape Cod and then have them face away from the sun. So they're in silhouette and you would paint the figure completely in silhouette. So you're forced to say what is happening in the shadow, I'm not just going to paint wow. a brown figure on the beach. Like what are the colors being reflected up into that, that flesh, um, what does it look like, you know? And, and it's funny because I found myself using green and purple and orange and all these colors to paint the flesh and it, and it worked in the end. But if, if you use your logical brain to think about it, it just is outrageous. And so yeah. um, I, kept, I kept all those studies and they're not very good <laughs> because it was, I was new to it, but I just love having those studies with me because I, it just forces me to think about that, you mm -hmm. know, that, that a, a specific color choice um, being specific. And again, it kind of goes full circle back to what we were talking about earlier with intention. Like I just want everything to have intention in the painting and every part of the painting to feel like it has a specific color and a specific relationship to something else and a specific purpose. So, um, I mean, I am an infant at it, but I'm at least aware of it. And I think in a way it's, it's the awareness that's the most important because you keep reminding yourself and 
coming back to it. It's like a meditation where you're lost in thought and, and you notice that your, your head's, you know, all over the place and your thoughts are racing a mile a minute. But if you can remember to come back to the present and just bring yourself back to that awareness and just, just being aware. And I think with painting, it's the same. It's like, it's like an awareness that you keep coming back to. It's like your core values as an artist and the kind of care that you want to put into your work. And, um, and so again, that comes back to why I'm so slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. So, you know, I've noticed in my, with getting older that I'm not painting slower, but I'm getting more particular. So I paint longer. Yeah. In other words, if I were to do the yeah. same thing I did 20 years ago, I would do it faster. But I'm trying yes. not to do the same thing I did 20 years ago. I'm trying to do it better. So it takes longer. And that's, yes. yeah, that's what I'm finding. And it's, it's a little frustrating, because I used to put out so many paintings back then, but they weren't <laughs> as good. So that's it yeah. is what it is, right? Well, um, that's you being very modest. I saw your paintings back then, and they were very, very, very good. So. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, yeah. so we're getting we're getting close to that ninety minute mark, but I wanted to ask you one more question that I ask almost everybody. Yeah. You know, hopefully, we're going to get a lot of viewers that are aspiring artists. And what you're obviously you've been very successful as an artist. What advice would you give an aspiring artist? Wow, that's a huge question. I know. I think it, of course, I'll think of the perfect thing after we hang up, but um, I think it goes back around to what we were discussing earlier about making yourself uncomfortable. I think for me, um, because I had such an established comfort zone as an artist, it was important to put myself in positions where I'd be made uh, uncomfortable and question my work. And I think that is a great thing to do as an artist, because obviously I could say the thing that people would expect me to say, which is study with everyone you can, take as many workshops as you can, um, go see as much original art in person as you can, because when you go and see your heroes in person, there's nothing like it. And you learn so much more from that. Um, so that, that stuff is all really important, um, seeing art in person and surrounding yourself with great art. But I'd say also choose situations that will make you uncomfortable, choose people to study with that have a different perspective than you do. And, um, I think that's a great way to become a more resilient and well-rounded artist in person. That's great advice. I appreciate that. And it's been a great conversation and a huge honor to have you on the show. So thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. I have to say, it was funny when you invited me to this podcast, I was very honored and excited. And also, I you didn't mention the name of the podcast. And so <laughs> when when I got an invitation from the undraped artist, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you came with your clothes on. That would have been extremely awkward for me. <laughs> but I just love that title and I love that you're doing this because I know I know you have a high octane schedule and yeah. you know your family life and your life as an artist as a creative person what you're doing in your studio personally and what you're doing with your commissions and your family life and your atelier and uh, all of your students and um there's just a, a million and one people that are vying for your attention. And um, I'm just really impressed that you're taking the time to have conversations like this with artists. And it's really oh, beautiful. Thanks. I'm thankful to be a part of it. Thanks. Well, it's selfish. I, I think of this as my education. <laughs> I'm learning a ton. No, I'm serious. I'm learning a ton. So again, thanks I'm so much it. for being willing to do it. It was great having you. Take care. My you too. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.